Since the dawn of civilization, humans have wondered where life came from. Explanations ranging from logical to the fantastical have popped up throughout history, which have brought forth various myths and legends in the process. One strange belief that persisted for thousands of years is that some living organisms actually came from inanimate objects. For instance, people from the Middle Ages all the way to ancient Egypt believed that frogs were born out of the mud. Meanwhile, the rats and mice which caused the horrible Black Death that swept Europe, Asia, and North Africa in the 13th century emerged out of the trash. Even ancient Greece was no stranger to the weird beliefs, for they have also thought that the bees and wasps came from dead cows and horses, respectively. This was the theory of spontaneous creation. According to this theory, living organisms would normally arise from non-living matter. This is different from a biogenesis is that the latter mostly deals with the origin of all life and that the most primitive form of life may have sprung from inorganic molecules. Spontaneous creation, on the other hand, is where an animal like bees and mice pops up out of certain places like dead cows and garbage, respectively. While now we know that to be a boatload of bullcrap, that was a doctrine that even the brightest minds of the day clung to for explanation. In the days before the invention of the microscope and its prototypes by Anton von Leeuwenhoek and Robert Hooke, people are unaware that there's a whole world filled with organisms that are invisible to the naked eye. But even then, people still have strange beliefs about the world that weren't fully understood until later on. For instance, even after the invention of the first microscopes, people, some of them pioneering scientists in the field, used to believe that the sperm contained miniature humans inside them. Known as the theory of preformationism, this was a popular belief in which forms of living things already exist before they fully develop. Thankfully, since then, our knowledge on biology, evolution, and genetics have developed by leaps and bounds, so we don't have to imagine ourselves as tiny humans inside a sperm cell or an egg cell, depending on who you ask. While humans was indeed full of strange theories and beliefs, we can't blame our ancestors for knowing so little about the world they just can't see. Microscopic organisms like bacteria, mold fungi, and viruses were, to their knowledge, simply non-existent. Similarly, before our knowledge of reproduction was complete, who in the past would have guessed that a sperm and egg would be needed to form a new human? And no, there wasn't a tiny person inside any of them. As such, people attempted to make sense of the world by creating possible explanations of how things came to be. Why they don't make sense to us now, they did so for them. Before the 17th century came along, people simply didn't know about these things. Or did they? A recent archaeological discovery found in the depths of Sudatausa, a small town in Yubate province in Cundamarca, Colombia, could throw everything we know about the history of genetics and microbiology. What if humans have already known the secret of life thousands of years before its purported discovery? This is the story of the mysterious artifact of Colombia's genetic disk. In 1964, a professor designer and architect by the name of Jamie Gutierrez Lega was visiting the town of Sudatauza, Colombia. A collector of ancient artifacts, Gutierrez Lega was no stranger to fantastic finds. However, the thing he found in Sudatauza would even be more remarkable, so remarkable, that its discovery has put our knowledge of ancient people in question. The details of how exactly he got the artifact was a bit murky. According to one theory, however, it might have once got into the vast collection of Father Carlos Crispia Croce, a Salesian monk from Italy, who became a missionary in Ecuador in the mid-1900s. Father Kuroshi was known to be an avid collector of artifacts from all around South America, buying it from the locals who usually found them in the jungle. It was theorized that the genetic disc Gutierrez Lega found later on might have been discovered before by Father Croce. 
how and why an artifact from a missionary stationed in Ecuador got onto the hands of a designer visiting Suratosa in Colombia wasn't explained, but it was a popular hypothesis. It's also worth noting that Ecuador and Colombia is next to each other, although to be fair, Suratosa itself is a thousand kilometers away from Surica, Ecuador, where Father Croce was stationed. But more about this in a moment. The disc, which measures 27 centimeters, 10 inches, in diameter and 2 kilogram, 4.5 pounds in weight, has made from lidite. Lidite, also known as lidostone or touchstone, is a radiolarian chert generally used for testing gold and silver alloys in the ancient times. As a touchstone, lidite is usually hard enough, but because it's composed of several layers, it can crack easily. Its material alone makes the artifact strange enough. How could it be possible that a relatively intricate carving was made on a stone that is fragile as lidite? Even with the current technology we have today, it's difficult to perfectly carve this material, let alone the people in the past. Or did they have a more sophisticated technique of carving, even on something like lidite, that we don't know about? However, the material was only the tip of the iceberg. It was the actual content of the disc that threw researchers out of the loop. On the front and back faces of the disc are strange carvings that at first glance seem to not mean anything. But upon closer inspection, what the disc depicts becomes obvious. It shows biological and genetic processes, including reproduction and evolution. This was astonishing, since as we all know, complete information about how animals and humans reproduce didn't exist until a few centuries ago. Like in our own story earlier, even in the late as the 1700s and 1800s, people still believed there were tiny humans living inside a sperm head. Sperm itself was only discovered by Anton von Leeuwenhoek in the mid 1600s and egg cell by Carl Ernst von Baer in early 19th century. Now the disc clearly depicts them. On the one side, depictions of what looked like the process of human reproduction is shown. The most obvious illustrations were that of a male and a female with reproductive organs shown, including carvings of information related to reproduction such as the ova, spermatozoa, and an embryo. On the outer circle is another depiction of what seemed to be the evolution of intrauterine life from a fetus to a fully grown infant. If you like what we do, support us by subscribing to the channel. Meanwhile, the other side of the disc was a bit more vague, but it also contains some details similar to the one above. One thing that separates it from the other side, though, is that it also depicts frog and snake-like beings, humans, and even cellular processes. Together, the images seem to depict illustrations of evolution, a particular being, and cell division. However, its enigma doesn't end there. Bugged by the question of who made the strange artifact, it was then given to a Museum of Natural History in Vienna, Austria, where it was presented by researcher, curator, writer Klaus Donna, who somehow attained it from Jamie Gutierrez Lega. Donna included it in this exhibition of artifacts in 2001. For this, Donna asked Dr. Vera M. F. Hammer to examine the genetic disk and find out its composition as well as other details that might lead them to a clue as to where and how the disc was made. According to reports, the genetic disc was made by the Musca, an indigenous people who lived in Colombia even before the Spanish conquest. The Musca was one of the most powerful civilizations in pre-Columbian era, with a rich mining industry. Later on, show to the University of Bogota, where researchers reportedly found out that it doesn't belong to any pre-Columbian civilizations, thereby estimated it to be at least 6,000 years old. Now, as you know, there wasn't any confirmed civilization in the world that existed before the Sumerians. Gobekli Tepe in Turkey and the likes of it doesn't count yet because we know so little of them. So who on earth made this artifact? Whether it was made by the Muska, as Dr. Hammer reportedly suggested or not, remains to be seen. But it's important to note that this particular area in Central and South America 
was home to many civilizations in the past, including the Musca. In fact, scientists had discovered only a year or so ago that ancient cities were buried deep in the Amazon rainforest. Father Crouchy was also said to have asserted the benefit that Krinka was an ancient underground system made up of tunnels that connects the city to the jungle. While he reportedly only said it was around 200 kilometers, 124 miles long, who actually knew how big it was that the underground system, if it actually existed? And if it did, was it in any way connected to the ancient civilizations in South America, like the one made on the mysterious genetic disk? Truly, the discovery of the genetic disk has caused some uproar among people, especially archaeologists and enthusiasts of lost, advanced civilizations. But how much, if any, of it is true? Is it real or a hoax? Since the discovery of the genetic disk, people are still wondering about the authenticity of the find, with many mainstream archaeologists proclaiming it as a hoax. To be honest, we ourselves are a bit hesitant on the discovery. There were many things that didn't just add up. In fact, while researching this topic, I only found bits of scattered information about the subject. There wasn't even any source of where the original story came from, except for blogs and a few videos about it. Even the links provided in the blogs that looked the most reliable to us either didn't work or the content was removed. The scarcity of information alone is already suspicious. Being made from lidite, how the carvings on the genetic disk were made was already a mystery in itself. It's not wholly impossible, but difficult enough to do. But here's the catch. The material may not even be carved on lidite at all. It's also possible that it was artificially made from hydite materials. As it stands, our current technology can't pinpoint exactly how and when a stone artifact, like the genetic disk, was formed. Carbon dating would likely show results on when the rock itself was formed. Meanwhile, since it's an out-of-place artifact, meaning nobody can say for sure yet what civilization made it, we have to nothing to compare it to, so that's that. While earlier it was stated that Dr. Vera estimated that the disc was made by the Musca, here's another problem in relation to that. Musca artwork and handicraft differ greatly from the ones made on the genetic disc. Now, onto the people involved in the story. Let's start with Dr. Vera M. F. Hammer. The people involved. To make it clear, all three people involved in the discovery of the genetic disc, not including Father Crouchy, was involvement is still a matter of debate. Did it in fact exist? However, the true version of events were murky at best. Dr. Vera M. F. Hammer, while she did indeed work on the Museum of Natural History and inspected the genetic disc given by Klaus Donna, clarified in one interview that she didn't classify the disc to any pure time period. But according to one article where the correspondence was published, the only comment Dr. Vera made was that the disc composition. In the XRD analysis done by Dr. Vera, it was found that the genetic disc was made of feldspar, mica, and quartz. Her former director suggested that it could be lidite, or just an artificial object made from the said materials. Except for that, Dr. Vera Hammer didn't say anything more. Worse, the museum scientist was even said to comment that most of the objects in the exhibit were hoax. If that included the disc itself, Dr. Vera didn't further elaborate. Next is Jamie Gortorez Lega. He was a notable designer and architect in Colombia. While there wasn't any indication that he made a hoax, his involvement in the story sure had gaps in it. From the supposed discovery to how it came to be the possession of Klaus Donna, there weren't any clear details provided. Whatever the case is, there were only a few sources online that connects him to the discovery, making the story and his involvement itself even more suspicious. Finally, Klaus Donna is well known for curating strange artifacts and writing about them. The main problem with this claim regarding the genetic disc was that there was very little evidence to support it. The scientists at Vienna confirmed that most of the objects in the exhibits are fakes. Meanwhile, the study he refers to, which was done in Colombia, didn't have any proof to back it up as well. 
he didn't name any researchers from the university, which makes it hard to check the veracity of its claims. Today, it's uncertain where the genetic disk is located, although you might see replicas of it being sold and studied somewhere. As for the supposed original, it's most likely that Donna still has it. The story of the genetic disk is fascinating. However, there are many things about it that isn't true. Not gonna lie, it would be exciting if it is. But unfortunately, as it stands, there wasn't much proof to back it up. However, this doesn't conclusively prove that our ancestors didn't have advanced knowledge back then. Who knows? Maybe in the future, we might find something else more convincing and authentic to this time. What about you? Do you believe that the genetic discs are genuine? Comment down below what you think about this enigmatic object. Deepen your adventure by watching our playlist. And if you want more, just play the next episode that comes up as a suggestion on your left.